All right, David's going to talk next about running a high-performance pluggable transport tour bridge. And go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, my name is David Fifield, and this is joint research with my uh, colleague, Linus Nordberg, who's here in the audience, um, who is a big part of... Uh, uh, we, he and I together run uh, one of the bridges for the Snowflake Puggable Transport, which was kind of the origin of this whole, um, this whole project. So I'll tell you more about what that's about. Here on the uh, page here, there's a URL for these slides in case you want to click on some of the links later. And then below here, there's an HTML version of the paper itself. Now, I know this is a bit of a specialized subject, but I think there's going to be enough here of general interest uh, to keep your attention. I am going to be talking specifically about Tor and specifically about Puggle Transports, but um, you know, you'll probably still learn something about um, how all these things work together. All right, so let me start by just, I want to lay everything out and give you the whole big picture, and then we'll back up and um, sort of evaluate things one by one. First point is that Tor, the current C implementation that everybody uses, has a problem with scaling. And specifically, that problem is that it cannot use more than one CPU core. So if you've got a big server with 128 gigs of RAM and 32 CPUs, Tor can only max out one CPU, and then your server's bottlenecked. Second point, this is actually not a problem for most relays, because most relays aren't processing enough traffic at one time to actually even max out one CPU. So most people don't even, this is not a problem for them. Uh, a lot of exit relay operators do know this, though, because there are fewer exit relays, so more traffic gets concentrated into them. So therefore, they um, have to deal with a lot more traffic, and therefore, they start running into these problems. People who run exits tend to run multiple exits exactly for this reason, because they can't get the performance they need when they run just one relay. So they're running on multiple, multiple hosts, multiple IP addresses to get around the scaling problem. It also affects certain bridges. Bridge is also kind of a special case because they also concentrate the traffic of many users. In the future, there's going to be a re-implementation of Tor. It's called RT. And it will probably make this problem go away. This will likely not be a problem in the future re-implementation of Tor. But until that happens, and that may still be a few years away, this is a technique you can use to make your bridges run fast. And also, I think it may actually have application, perhaps, to things like exit relays. That's untested, but the same technique, the same principle should work. All right, so there's the big picture. Now we're going to step back and um, kind of uh, uh, take a more gentle, gentle introduction to that. These are not settled terms, but for the purpose of this talk, I want to talk about direct access transports and indirect access transports. There's this great technical paper from 2006, Design of a Blocking Resistant Anonymity System. Um, if you haven't read this paper, or if you haven't read it in a while, it is definitely worth revisiting. This paper from 2006 is remarkably forward-looking. I'm always amazed when I go back and read it, and I think about all the things that this anticipated. It's really, really good. It's about a design. This was sort of before even pluggable transports. This was like laying out the design for Tor bridges. And let me read you this quote. Today, Tor relays operate on a few thousand distinct IP addresses. An adversary could enumerate and block them all with little trouble because they're all in a document called the consensus. You just download it and block the IP addresses. To provide a means of ingress to the network, we need a larger set of entry points, larger than a few thousand, most of which an adversary won't be able to enumerate easily. So I'm calling this direct access transports because these bridges, uh, vanilla Tor bridges and many of the obfuscated bridges, work by you making a direct TCP connection to that host, which also hosts the bridge. So you're directly accessing that bridge. What that means is the addresses of those, it means two things. It means one, that the addresses of those bridge need to be secret. The, the, the blocking resistance of the whole scheme rests on the secrecy of those bridge addresses. So the part that I've highlighted here, when you get a bridge line um, from bridges.torproject.org or whatever, it looks like this. There's an IP address and a port in there. This one is already well known, don't worry. <laughs> and uh, you, everyone needs to keep those secret because if everyone reveals those bridge addresses, then they become known to the sensor and they all get blocked. Okay? So there's a secret we need to keep here. So one, secrecy of bridges is paramount. And two, you need a lot of these because you expect some level of attrition. You expect some level of leakage. You expect some level of enumeration by a sensor that eventually these things will be blocked. So you actually need a sufficient number to make this blocking resistant, all right? So this is characteristic of these direct access transports. 
But this is not the only type of circumvention transport as we know. Oh, and uh, one last point about this. Because having a large number of bridges is a necessary component for this type of transport to be blocking resistant, you don't have any torque scaling problem. You have so many of them that the usership is diffuse and diverse. So none of them gets a particularly large number of users. But we know there's other types of um, circumvention transports, and we'll call them indirect tra access transports for this. And that's when you don't actually make a direct TCP connection to the bridge. So Meek, domain fronting, you go through a CDN or whatever, and then that CDN goes to the bridge. You're more worried about the CDN getting blocked than you are about the bridge getting blocked, because you never actually access the bridge. You don't care if it's blocked. Um, likewise, Snowflake, you go through one of many uh, temporary proxies, right? You never access the bridge directly. You may care that a sensor knows how to enumerate or fingerprint um, or block those proxies somehow, but you don't care about the bridge. In these cases, you actually don't need thousands of bridges. The security system doesn't rely on having numerous bridges. You really only need one bridge because the indirect access is just going to go to that one bridge. And it's actually much more convenient just to run one bridge. Here's an example of what a Snowflake bridge line looks like. Um, I have replaced the IP address here with um, X's. In practice, we actually have a real IP address there, but it's one reserved for documentation. And it's there just because it's syntactically required. We don't actually use that IP address for anything. The thing about this bridge line is that there's no secret information in it anywhere. You can show this whole thing to a sensor, and it doesn't give them an advantage in blocking the system. Right? Because they actually want to try to block access to those proxies, because that is what you are actually directly connecting to. So there's a key difference. So it's nice about this that we don't need to keep secrets. You know, it's kind of a different paradigm. It gives us some different tools to play with. You only need one bridge, but that brings us to the Tor scaling problem. So that's the genesis of this whole system. We deployed Snowflake. Uh, things were good. Things were awesome. We started getting users, and then we hit a performance plateau. So this was December 2021. It was exactly, I remember, December 1st, 2021. It's very fixed in my memory. This was an important day uh, in Russia. Virtually all forms of access to Tor were at least attempted to be blocked on at least a subset of IPs, uh, of ISPs somehow. And so that included vanilla Tor, that included a fraction of the bridges, it included OBS4, it included in a very small number of ISPs, Meek, and it included a fingerprint against Snowflake. Well, we were able to mitigate the fingerprint against Snowflake within a couple of weeks, and the attempted blocking in Russia had this paradoxical effect of actually greatly increasing the number of Snowflake users in Russia. So this increase here in the middle of December, almost entirely attributable to users in Russia. The, the usage went up, they, they constituted over 60% of Snowflake users at that point. But you can see right here, it happened pretty quick. Right into January, we start kind of flattening out. And that's not because interest had dropped to use Snowflake. That's because our bridge got saturated. And I, was, I remember looking at all these like, performance graphs and uh, profiles and things like that and scratching my head for a while and thinking, you know what? I think Tor is the bottleneck here. And it turns out that's what it was. So it started off this. Um, it's going to go down as like one of the great threads in history uh, on the Tor forum, on the Tor Relays mailing list, uh, how to reduce Tor CPU load on a single bridge. And here I want to give a lot of credit to Roger Dingledine, who was an active participant on that bridge and gave us a lot of the um, uh, early confidence that, yeah, you can actually do this sort of slightly strange thing, which I'm about to describe. You actually can run multiple copies of Tor, force them all to have the same identity keys, and it will actually kind of work. It will do what you want. You're going to have to deal with a few complications, which I think I won't be able to discuss in full during this talk. But it will basically work. And we worked it out, and we got a prototype. And that is eventually what led us to where we are today. Um, this is what I wrote. The main Snowflake bridge is starting to become overloaded because of a recent substantial increase in users, mostly from Russia. I think the host has sufficient CPU and memory headroom. And the pluggable transport process is scaling across multiple tours, but the tour process is constantly using 100% of one CPU core. So this is the classic, this is the classic problem. Um, I think this is kind of maybe well-known among some Tor relay operators, but I don't think it's well-known that uh, among the public at large that um, Tor has, currently has this limitation. So the, um, the answer to this, which you can read more about in the paper, we have um, documentations and things for it. Uh, you run multiple Tor processes on one host. So currently on a Snowflake bridge, we're running 12 Tor processes in parallel. 
and we use a load balancer to distribute traffic evenly among them. And what that means is each one of those Tor processes can use it up to 100% of one CPU core, and then you just run as many as you need to keep them all below 100%, right? So let me show you a picture of what a Tor a, a server pluggable transport usually looks like. The classic way of destroying, of deploying a pluggable transport, the, uh, the intended way, is you run Tor, and in this configuration file, you say, here's the location of my pluggable tr transport binary and um, the parameters I want you to give it. Tor itself spawns the pluggable transport as a subprocess. It gives it a bunch of configuration in the form of environment variables, and then that subprocess is what actually receives connections from the outside, and then it, the, that subprocess forwards them back to Tor uh, over a local TCP connection. So here is clearly a problem because it assumes, this whole model assumes one singular instance of Tor because there is something that is spawning the pluggable transport subprocess. So what we do is kind of turn this inside out. And this is the picture of how it works currently on the Snowflake bridges. Here we have four, but there's actually 12 in our current deployment. So we run the Snowflake server here. This is taking the place of any general public uh, pluggable transport process. We run that, and that receives connections from the outside. They happen to be WebSocket HTTPS connections. That forwards to a load, pro a, a load balancer, HA proxy, and that's configured to forward to all of the different Tor instances. And then each one of those just makes its connections to the middle relays, and then that forwards to the exits, and then that eventually gets out um, to the user's intended destination. There's no synchronization of all these different Tor processes except that we artificially when we start up, we arbitrarily choose one, we take all its keys, and we copy it into all the others. So they all share the same like crypto identity. There are two complications which I cannot get into deeply uh, because of uh, time restrictions, but we've written more about this. Uh, the first is this XOR static cookie that is hanging out below these. This is kind of a necessary component just to deal with a technical limitation turns out when you're forwarding the connection into Tor over that local TCP connection, that's actually an authenticated connection. There's a little handshake that happens at the beginning of that. And if you don't take special steps, every single Tor instance will use a different authentication key. And because you're going through a load balancer, you don't know which one you'll be assigned to. So we insert a little shim there that just says, here's a constant uh, authentication key that you can depend on, and then it forwards that into the real Tor. So kind of an annoying complication, but we needed to put it in there. The other complication is that there's another set of keys that Tor relays use that they rotate periodically. Every uh, 28 days, they rotate these keys, and we have to inhibit that, because otherwise, each one of these instances, which is independent from all the others, would rotate its keys, and eventually they would drift out of sync, and you wouldn't be able to make, um, make circuits through them. All right, clear enough? So this is a pretty simple idea, right? If one Tor process pegs the CPU, well, just run multiple of them and use a load balancer. That's what load balancers are for. But it did take a lot of time and care to get here. And as I say, there are a couple of non-trivial complications that go along with this. All right, yes, yeah, so um, I'll tell you what, happened, what has happened with Snowflake since then. So you remember that graph a few slides ago that looked so impressive? That was like this 1,500 up to like 6,000. You're like, whoa. OK, so that is actually um, this part of this graph. <laughs> um, this has been Snowflake since then, and it really is almost good that this happened because it forced us to settle on this implementation and make us ready for what was to come. Does anyone remember what happened at the last, uh, last few weeks of September 2022? Yeah, these were the protests in Iran. Um, this was, <laughs> this was a, a rough week. Um, uh, for some reason, Snowflake took off immediately there at the beginning of this protest. You can see it jumped up to like 100K users. Uh, then it dropped off here. This was actually another blocking event. But eventually, we mitigated that, and you see it climb back up. Um, this was only possible because of this load balance multiple Tor architecture. Um, but I should say that alone is not sufficient. We also needed to put in some significant resources and investment into buying better server hardware, getting a faster network link. That's a lot of what um, Linus's expertise has come in handy there, actually making this work on an operational basis. So just deploying these multiple tours is not magic. We had done that. We hit another performance plateau, and that's when we decided we need to actually start getting some better hardware. But if you, do, if you design your tour bridge the way that we show here, you will actually be able to use all of the hardware that you're paying for.
that's the idea. Uh, so let's see, I want to show you kind of what this looks like. Um, we didn't get to, we didn't have room for this in the paper, so you're getting kind of a bonus here. Uh, what does this look like on the server in terms of um, CPU use? Here are the four main components here. The top part is the actual pluggable transport process, sitting pretty at about 1,800% CPU. Uh, I, uh, if I had my own laptop, I would show you the HTOP output here with like every meter pegged in the red and, <laughs> and uh, uh, run times of like 3,000, it's, it's crazy. Um, and then here's the Tor process. And then here are these two other things. The bottom one's the load balancer, and here's all of those XDOR static cookie ones together. So on our, on our system, the Snowflake server uses about half the CPU capacity, uh, Tor uses about a quarter, and then the other two things use about an eighth each. And this bridge is actually already saturated again. As you can probably tell by the flatness of these peaks during the daily peaks, it should not be that flat. If we could give it more resources, those would, those would keep going up higher. But this is about how the balance works. And if you had a pluggable transport that was less demanding than Snowflake, you know, you would be able, you would have more CPU headroom. You would be able to do more here. Um, and then this is what the RAM looks like. So the blue line here is Tor. Instantly, interestingly, keeps kind of a, a steady RAM profile. The Snowflake server um, goes up and down with the daily uh, traffic peaks. It's like garbage collecting and things. And the other two are basically negligible in, in terms of RAM usage. So yeah, our current, our current bottleneck on this server is um, CPU. We're still pretty good on RAM. All right, yeah, so summary. Um, most bridges don't need this technique. If you're running an Ops4 bridge, you don't need to do this, unless perhaps you're running one of the default Tor bridges, the ones that are hard-coded into Tor browser. Then this may actually be useful, because I suspect uh, probably more than one of those is actually CPU limited. But if you're just running Ops4 bridges and you want to help more, just run more bridges. That's actually the best advice there. But this could be useful for bridges for other types of indirect access transports, like Conjure, which is an up-and-comer in Tor browser. You can actually use it now. The Conjure bridge is, uh, could also benefit from something like this. And I would really be interested in seeing this technique applied to exit nodes and seeing whether it's relevant there. Even with this, it can't solve everything. You eventually, hardware becomes a limit. I showed you the CPU and RAM graph of the one bridge. We actually have a second Snowflake bridge now. So uh, even with all these, all these tricks and optimizations, you know, we still need to start like, scaling horizontally. Um, and currently, if you use Snowflake, you'll be using one of the two bridges that exist. There is an online, if you actually want to do this, if you have a bridge that you want to deploy this on, I think this um, bridge installation guide is going to want to be your first stop, because here we spell out everything, and we give you all the configuration files and everything you'll need to do. Uh, to make this happen. And then uh, finally, all this hardware and stuff doesn't come for free, and we've had to set up a uh, fundraising platform and try and keep this sustainable. So this is, goes towards um, making the bridge keep running, because um, when you get to user levels like we're at, you actually have to start thinking about sustainability and funding and things like that. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Um, this may be a, a jet lag question, mm -hmm. so bear with me. Um, for the indirect bridges um, yeah. at this scale, like they don't need to be secret; they're big, right? Yeah. Why? Why not just like incorporate this into the main Tor network and have the Tor relays do it? Okay. So the question is, why not just have Tor relays do this? Because relays also don't need to be secret. Right? They're just the publicly known things. And I think that's the idea with the RD re-implementation. Like, RD is effectively going to be doing this, but within its own process. It's just going to be properly multi-threaded and won't be a problem. I have asked some of the CTOR, the Corridor developers, uh, whether this will probably change in the current implementation. They say probably not, not until RD. That's my impression. Uh, Tobias Hiewig, Max Planck Institute for Informatics. Um, can you quantify how much it would cost to scale like by one and two orders of magnitude from the current setup? So one million and 10 million users? Yes, yeah, so the question is how much would it cost to scale by one or two orders of magnitude from where we are? So one million or 10 million users. Um, rough ballpark estimate is you're probably looking at 
you know, maybe $100,000 a year. Um, bandwidth is kind of a big part of it, and, you know, it depends on what kind of deals you can get. Uh, I didn't show a bandwidth graph, but currently that bridge, and that's one of two, is doing like three to four gigabits per second, um, you know, which you, you've got to pay for things like that. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I'm just curious, you said Snowflake was about 50% of your CPU utilization when you yeah. looked. Uh, what's it doing? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't want to get too deep into that because that's really a more Snowflake-specific question. The question is, what is Snowflake doing with all that 50%? It's actually doing quite a lot because it's receiving TLS connections. Uh, so it's terminating TLS. It's um, doing WebSocket. It's actually doing um, a session layer reconstruction thing. So it's, uh, it's reconstructing sessions and doing assembly, and it has a uh, reassembly of, um, of internally encapsulated packets and things like that. And um, uh, I mean, I've actually put a lot of profiling effort into the Snowflake server, and um, uh, I would like to reduce that. But it is kind of a complicated thing. Any other questions? Okay, then I'll take the last one. Okay. Um, I think you maybe mentioned something about documentation at the end. I was busy over there in the sure. laptop, but do you have any plans to make this like an easy to use tool, kind of like Onion Balance, where you can install it and just kind of run it and maybe set some configuration command line options and then it will do the rest of the hard work for you? Yeah, so the question here is, are there any plans to make this an automated, easy to use tool uh, to, to do automate most of that uh, guide that I showed you? And uh, you'll actually want to talk to Shell about that. Um, Shell has uh, put together a partial, um, I, forget, I forget the details, sorry. Ah, I see. Yeah, so I guess the question there is we haven't done it yet because we've only um, set up the two bridges, and at some point it will become annoying, and then we'll be forced into automating it. Let's thank the speaker again.